Hi, welcome to this episode of Better Life Today. We love animals, and so today I'm really excited to introduce as my guest, Dave Sidden. Great. And you are the Executive Director at Wildlife Images. I am indeed. Well, welcome to the program. We, we have animals, we have pets, and we see a lot of wildlife in the, in the area too. So I'm, I'm always interested in finding out about the organizations in the area and what why they are there, how they came into being. So please tell me a little bit about yourself, Dave. I grew up with a father that was sort of a bigger than life character, you know, big booming voice and very big presence and sort of command presence. And he was a filmmaker, photographer, a writer, and primarily centered around wildlife. Okay. So I grew up in a household with wild animals of all sorts. You never knew what was going on. And he was off on expeditions filming all the time, you know, whether the, in the Sea of Cortez, we went on an expedition where we uh, banded 5,000 baby pelicans. Really? And uh, they were worried about, it. this was in the late 60s, and the DDT phenomenon was going on, and the pelican, brown pelican population went from hundreds of thousands of them off the coast of California, just a few hundred in hmm. just a matter of you know six or seven years. So they wanted to know what the heck was going on. So uh, expedition was formed. My dad went along to film the expedition. And a good friend of our family was Eddie Albert, the person that started in Green Acres and all this sort of thing. So we went, went along as a celebrity spokesperson. And right. a wonderful band anyway. So anyway, he did this film on uh, the brown pelicans and the DDT phenomenon. And when it went out, it helped uh, create a ban on DDT. And made uh, he actually changed the world. So the pelican population came back and bald eagles and peregrine falcons and a lot of the apex predators came back because DDT was eliminated from the environment, or the use of DDT is mm -hmm. still hanging out in the environment. Unfortunately, it's there forever, um, but it made a real substantial difference. So I grew up doing uh, film work, and then at a very early age, I went to work at uh, SeaWorld in San Diego, okay. where I started off with a waterfowl collection, and we built the largest waterfowl collection in the world at the time. And I learned more about ducks and geese than anybody has any right to at the time. <laughs> and then I moved from there to the training department and worked with killer whales primarily for the next uh, seven or eight years, wow. training killer whales and doing the shows there. Okay. And then from there, went back to my dad's film business for a while. Did I shot a feature motion picture myself. We did all the Buick commercials that had the hawk landing on all the Buicks every year. And then from there, I went up to the Oregon Zoo and worked there 12 years in charge of all their programs. And I was the spokesperson for the Oregon Zoo. And then in 1996, my father called and said that he was dying of cancer. Yeah. And would I consider taking wildlife images over for him so his dream didn't die with him? How do you say no to that? Absolutely. So I left my job at the zoo and took over wildlife images uh, 25 years ago now. And been there ever since. I have indeed. So that, uh, that answers one of my questions then, the, the name of Wildlife Images. It's not really what I would have expected when I discovered that you were in the area. Yeah, it's not a, a name that immediately brings to mind uh, what Wildlife Images is. Dad's dream was, you know, all the film work, all the photo photographs he had taken, maybe the residuals over the years for those things would pay Wildlife Images mm -hmm. uh, to move forward and uh, start uh, basically an endowment for Wildlife right. Images. But um, it turned out that films with animals never got residuals and it never did work out that way. So it's always been one of these things where you're struggling to make the next dollar to pay the vet bills and all right. the things that we have to do at Wildlife Images. And you do quite a lot. It's not saying you have, and we'll talk about this later, but you have some sort of a summer camp program. We do. You have, you know, you can go in there and look at animals, but you also have an animal hospital. We do our rehabilitation work is probably our biggest contribution. You know, mm. we treat in about 1,200 animals a year that come into us. Really? These are animals that are injured or orphaned or 
whatever, we take them in, patch them up as best we can, and then hopefully return them back out into the wild. And what kind of animals do you care for? It's everything from hummingbirds to bobcats. Uh, it's a, a huge range. We used to do bears and things like that, but we're not doing the bears now. We're just doing the smaller, mm -hmm. more, more uh, compact animals. But uh, the volume seems to always increase because, of course, as this area grows, there's fewer wild spaces. Yep. There's more people out there stomping around the woods finding these injured and orphaned animals to bring them in for us. So our job becomes more important every year. Right, so why aren't you doing the bears anymore? Well, it became a point with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They wanted to have the bears in a, another location to treat them. Mm. Um, so they're taking their, the rehab bears now to Idaho and having them worked with uh, up in Idaho. And so, um, you know, it's fine. We just repurposed our containment areas to handle some of the other animals that we have now and just kind of shifted things around a little bit. Right. And how does that contact work? I mean, are people, they encounter the animals injured and they contact you directly? Yeah. Or is it through another organization? That uh, you're all in? of the above, actually. Okay. The, the general public can find an animal, pick it up and bring them into us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we get them from state police, we get them from sheriff's mm -hmm. office, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Federal Fish and Wildlife. So it's a ton of different sources that all bring their animals. And we're the only place in Southern Oregon, really, that handles the uh, the animals that we do. So I'm, I'm looking at my notes here and it turns out that one of our staff members has actually brought several birds in mm -hmm. to, to be treated. What, what did that look like? What did the process look like? There? Well, typically when the animals come in, of course we have to fill out a lot of records because we have to have you know, our permits and compliance. Mm. So we have permits from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, USDA. And so we have to get all the information about where the animal came in from, what the type of injuries, whatever it was. Right. And part of this is so that we can take the animal once it's recovered and release it where it came from. Okay. Because they're very territorial sometimes, mm. so you want to return them to right where they came from if we can. So once the animal comes in, we fill out all the paperwork, it goes into um, the clinic for sort of a triage. We try to figure out what's wrong with the critter, you know, be it poisoning or hit by a car or just an orphan that's starving or whatever, figure out what the problem is and then start the repair process. And uh, sometimes that could take a year or two. We got a fisher in last year that um, seemed to have spinal damage. Somebody was seeing it on their property, and fishers are very rare. They're like a big ferret, about that long. Okay. And, uh, really beautiful animals. So they're very rare to the area. They, they saw this guy, and it was dragging his hindquarters, couldn't figure out what was going on. They managed to pick it up and bring it into us, and we did x-rays, we did every kind of exam, couldn't find anything physically wrong with the critter, so we just started um, some rehab therapy on the thing and uh, muscle manipulation and getting it in water so it can swim and use its limbs. And over the course of about six or seven months, the thing made a full recovery and was climbing and doing everything a fisher should go do and was released back out into the wild. But you know, having the location where it came in is critical because they have a habitat, they know where to find food right. and all that sort of thing. So we try to do that every time we can. Do you ever get to hear stories of, of when they've been reintroduced into the area, how they're doing? Is there any sort of monitoring or do you get some of that positive feedback? Not as much as we'd like. You know, yeah. you always dream about this sort of Disney release or whatever. Right. <laughs> and there's this um, time when my father, I know he had a bald eagle that came in. And I can't remember the extent of the injury. I think it was a poisoned bald eagle. Mm. Came in and went through the whole rehab process. So it took about a year. And they took the, the bird back out to where it came in from and released it off this precipice. The eagle took to the air and another eagle came in and joined and they started doing the courtship flight together and it was probably its, its mate, you know. Right. And so you always hope for an ending like that, but you know, it rarely happens. Right. So that's, that's your hospital, but you also have permanent residents as well. Tell me about those. Yeah, permanent residents are animals that have not been able to be returned to the wild for okay. some reason or another. Typically, they are, or they're acquired maybe for education. Mm. Um, so we have a, a, about 100 resident animals, and they range from the wolves that we have to bobcats to um, some of the small birds and all that. And that's our basically the staple so that people, when they come out to visit wildlife images, can get a little taste of what wildlife is in this, right. this area. Because we have a very unique area, and it's fairly uh, abundant wildlife population now. And people like coming out and seeing a, a bobcat or a cougar mm -hmm. or a bear or whatever it is. And so it's a, it makes a really nice atmosphere for people to spend some time with us. 
Right, so these are, these are animals that are native to this area then? We, are, we do, primarily. We have some non-native animals as well. We have a pair of king vultures and a few mm. other animals that are non-native because they do, you know, a part of the conservation messages is to think locally, act globally, right. um, so that we use the conservation message to spread awareness of the global population problems with wildlife and the, the struggles they're having. And king vultures being from the tropical rainforest, which are being devastated at a horrendous rate yeah. to make rooms for plantations and all that. And so having those guys makes a lot of sense for people to see them. Right, absolutely. So what, I mean, most of them are local, what is the furthest that you know of that an animal has traveled to come to your facility? We got a black bear in from Palermo, Italy. And her name was Jane Bear. She was one of the smallest black bears. And apparently she was part of almost like a kidnapping plot. She was taken as a cub from here in Oregon somewhere, put on a ship, and the sailors kept her as a pet, chained on the boat. Mm -hmm. And as they traveled wherever they went, you know, she came along with them. Finally, they got to Palermo, Italy, and got the bear off the boat, and it was found chained in front of a pet store in Palermo, Italy. Somebody recognized it as a North American black bear. They got a hold of the U.S. Humane Society, and they got the embassy in Italy to interact, and lo and behold, they got the bear confiscated and shipped to Wildlife Images. So Jane Bear spent the rest of her life at Wildlife Images. She lived about 20 more years at Wildlife Images. Right. So how did they find out about you? I mean, it seems, I mean, we're in Grants Pass, Oregon. Yeah, it seems <laughs> unlikely that they'd find us, yeah. but we apparently have established quite a reputation with yeah. bears. We've rehabilitated and returned to the wild probably about 70 black bears over the, wow. over the time. And we had a resident population of 17 black bear when I took mm. the place over. So we had quite a bit of experience with bears. And Jane was probably the smallest bear that we had, but also the king of the heap. She had the attitude that went along with the, <laughs> the size. And even the bear the twice her bear. size. Yeah, the, the bear <laughs> twice her size backed right off when Jane right. came around. So she was a, a good little bear to have around. Wow, and how many bears do you have now? We only have one right now. One bear. Yeah, so um, our grizzly bear is a, a female grizzly bear is the one we have left. We don't have any black bears at all right now. So unfortunately, that's something that we hopefully will be attending to in the near future. Right, well, obviously there's, there's a need. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And people are always looking for somebody, a re reputable organization to help. So. Yes, and it's like you can't go shopping for black bears typically. Right. You know, when they come in, we're not allowed to keep our own patients. So if we were to oh. treat a black bear, we're not allowed to keep it for okay. ourselves for education. So it has to come from another facility. And the laws are changing pretty rapidly, so it makes it more and more difficult to get mm -hmm. wildlife for education. So we're trying to stay within the confines that, of the law. Is that because things are abused at times at some facilities? It's not real clear where the uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has their structure for their laws uh -huh. and their administrative rules. I'm not sure how they all come about, but it's been more difficult than ever for us to obtain wildlife for doing education. So we have to take all the steps necessary to make sure we do it the right way. Hey, I want to thank you for being here. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to meet a friend that you brought in. So we'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome back. I'm visiting with my friend Dave Sitton from Wildlife Images, and he just brought out a, a new friend here. Her name is Rosie. And tell me a little bit about Rosie, Dave. Well, Rosie is a Virginia possum. They're uh, an animal that's now indigenous to Oregon, but mm. they're an invasive species, actually. They didn't originally occur in, North, in this part of North America. The Rocky Mountains were a natural boundary for a lot of species. They're too high to cross and you know, too perilous to get across. So the opossums were only found in the south or the south and east of the United States, primarily. So it was a, a rumored around World War I when the troop trains were coming back from southeast back up to, you know, 
uh, camps up in Washington and Oregon or wherever, uh, California. Some of the troops used to eat possums, so they'd bring them along on the troop train. Really? And the army and their infinite wisdom said, turn those things loose. And so that got a population established on the West Coast, which it wouldn't normally have had. So these are more adapted to the Southeast, the humid, sticky er areas of the United States and not really made for Oregon. But they've been here now for probably, you know, 70 or 80 years. Their population seems to be increasing all the time. So these are one of the animals that we really don't rehabilitate because they're a non-native. So okay. they displace other animals, you know, like skunks or the raccoons or other animals that we'd have in this area uh, very commonly. Um, they're interesting animals, kind of a genetic junkyard. They're <laughs> they've got the tail kind of of a rat and the eyeballs of something else. And they're um, pretty interesting little critters. You can't go out and take them in as pets. That's not allowed. They're against the law to have as pets. And they have this sort of semi-prehensile, almost rat-looking tail. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are adapted to uh, our life here pretty well. And one of the big advantages to them, they seem to like to eat ticks. So oh. out in the wild, they'll forage for things like ticks. And so that'd be wonderful to have them destroy all the ticks yeah. around. But uh, unfortunately, though, they don't belong here in Oregon, so we can't rehabilitate them. But they make a great educational ambassador. Um, uh, for some reason, the opossums have a very short lifespan, too. Hmm. Typically, um, they only live about three years, and uh, they check out. And so unfortunately, they do have a very short span. But they're one of the few marsupials we have in North America too. So unlike our normal mammals here where they just give live birth, mm -hmm. these guys of course have a pouch like an animal from Australia would. Right. So the youngster is born at a very early age, makes its way into a, the pouch, stays in the pouch until it's big enough to come out on, the, on its own. And then they typically get up in the the mom's back and ride her around. And so that's how the babies get around with mom. I gotta get her moved up here yeah, a little bit so we can like see her. It looks like that's how she's, she's nestling she's down enjoying in the being on your back as well. She's saying, <laughs> I'm, I, I wanna hear the stories, but I don't wanna be part of it. <laughs> um, so anyway, they're, they're real interesting sort of animals. And uh, so they make a great educational ambassador for us. They are easy to haul around. They're, right. they're pretty uh, mellow to uh, work with. <laughs> and she's just wanting to go by. She's a little stage fright, I guess. Right. She wants to go back in the back. Come back out here, Rosie. So how did, how did Rosie come to the Wildlife Images family? Um, we acquired her. We got her in as a baby and asked permission from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife mm. if we could keep her as an ambassador for Wildlife Images because they are so interesting. And, you know, we need more animals animals that people can really see up close and touch and right. whatever. And um, it's so hard to find animals that we can do that now anymore. All the laws and the insurance and all this and that, it's very, very hard to make people have a, give people the opportunity to connect with wildlife. And I think that's a critical step because if right. you connect with animals, you do a better job of protecting them. Absolutely. And um, you know, our kids today that go through Camp Eek are gonna be our future voters and they're gonna be the future caretakers of this this planet and what goes on in it. So if they have an experience with a wild animal like this, it can change their whole life. And of course, the lives of many of their species and other right. species as well. Well, Dave, you mentioned Camp Eek. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, Camp Eek is environmental education in kids. That's where the okay. Eek comes from. And it's our camp for kids during the summertime. And we also do it during the Christmas break and other breaks. And it's a chance for our kids to come out at Wildlife Images and spend from a day to a week with us. And they get close encounters with wildlife and they get to do all sorts of activities like enrichment for animals and learn about wildlife habitats and experience the animals firsthand. So it's a, a really cool, rich environment for the kids so they can learn firsthand how wonderful our animals are and how important they are to all of us. Rosie. Well, and I can give an endorsement with that. Our, one of my sons, Elliot, okay. actually spent a week at Camp Eek a How, couple of years ago, and he really enjoyed it. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we we're, we're going to be almost doubling the capacity this coming mm. summer because we've added a new uh, classroom, basically. It's a yurt that we've added there so that we can have more kids and have more experiences with the animals and also um, it's, uh, it's going to be even better than ever. And all through the winter, our staff there works on the curriculum so they mm. can freshen up the curriculum and make it more interesting. And we learn every year, you know, here's what the kids really, really like. So let's do more of this and more of that and, and fine tune it. So it's getting to be a well-oiled machine right now. Right. And the kids just seem to really, really eat it up. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me more about your staff. How many staff do you have and are they... <sighs> 
mostly volunteers? What does it look like? Um, we have about the equal number of staff and volunteers, and the, the volunteers are the lifeblood of wildlife images, you know, because we have to squeeze every nickel as tight as we can to make it make it work, because sure. it's, uh, co it costs almost a million dollars a year to keep the place operational, wow. so it's very expensive. And we, um, of course, animals are expensive, and vet care is expensive, and insurance is expensive, mm -hmm. payroll is expensive. So we have about 30 staff people and about 30 volunteers right now, and we hope to up the numbers of volunteers, but it's subject to you know COVID and the gas prices and yeah. so many difficulties right now yeah. that we just have to kind of take small steps. And we've got some volunteers that drive from Ashland twice a week mm. to come up and be part of Wildlife Images. And they're doing everything from cleaning compounds to making diets to working with some of the animals. So they do all aspects of the care there. And they help us stretch it all or much, much farther. So the volunteer programs are amazing. And Krista, the one that runs our volunteer program, is incredible yep. with the volunteer. She does a, an amazing job with that stuff. Oh, for, for Camp E, does, do the kids have an opportunity to do what the volunteers do? Are they learning some of those skills as well? They do indeed. Yeah, we have the kids doing all kinds of opportunities, primarily things like building enrichment. Now, enrichment for a wild animal in captivity is basically something you can do in the environment to make them think or to interact with their environment. Mm. So in the case of, you know, like Rosie or a small animal of this sort, we'll make really unique places to hide her food. You know, it could be a paper mache animal with food in it, and, right. it, and she has to think and figure out how to manipulate and get the food out of this object. So that could be, and it could be, a, you know, there could be enrichment objects that we do for cougars mm -hmm. and for bobcats or bears or whatever. So each animal um, really appreciates the enrichment. It makes their life a lot more interesting in captivity. So we're constantly doing that sort of thing. And of course, diets too, they get involved in preparing diets for the animals, mm -hmm. and that's always a wonderful thing. Huh. <laughs> yeah. I think she's enjoying her, her time on your show. Yeah, she's there. getting a little bit more used to it now. They're so shy, and of course, these guys are primarily nocturnal in the wild, so you right. don't see them out during the daytime, they're out during the nighttime, so I'm waking her up in the middle yeah, of the night. Yeah, it's a little bright in here. Yeah, it so. is. <laughs> so you talked about the challenges that, that um, funding and whatnot, <laughs> so how, what does your fund, fundraising process look like? Um, it's multi-step fundraising. We do everything from, you know, we do a, a, a holiday ask, basically. We send a lot of holiday cards mm -hmm. out, which is our biggest fundraiser. We do a fundraiser in, coming up in July, I think it's July 9th, we're doing our big fundraiser, which is Saving Wildlife, and it's a really nice dinner, and we have a live auction, and, you know, trips, like there's trips to Africa and things right. like that, that people could bid on and get be part of. Um, then we also do things like um, grants that we work mm -hmm. on. We charge admission, which helps a little bit. Gift shop sales contributes a little bit. So we have to be multifaceted and be very creative. Sometimes estate planning, that's made a huge difference mm -hmm. in wildlife images. Sometimes people will leave us their estates and that's saved our bacon more than once. Right. So, And it's getting tougher and tougher and more competitive, you know, because the uh, the market right now with, with um, the human needs now always yeah. trumps the animal needs. So they're, most of the money that we used to be able to rely on is now going to human needs. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting tougher and tougher to raise money for the wildlife. Right. Uh, tell me, I have, I've heard about Brady. Can you tell me a little bit about Brady? Oh, Brady, he's uh, our cougar. And okay. he's just got a, that bigger than life personality. He's just an amazing cat. And it's um, in the, the day we used to raise cougars. In fact, when I took wildlife images over, we had seven cougars. We only have Brady as the only one right now. Mm -hmm. And he is just a, a sweetheart, just a wonderful personality. He's one of those cats that, um, since we had him as a little guy, I kind of worked with him, so he recognizes my voice, and I can usually call him. And right. you know, calling cats usually doesn't work real well, but this particular cat seems to recognize me and comes over to the fence and mm -hmm. interacts. And uh, he's just fabulous to work with. And of course, it's spectacular to see a, have a people come up and see a cougar, oh, yeah. you know. And it's amazing their their coloration is designed, of course, to be hidden. So they'll be up there looking into the compound and he's got probably half an acre he can go hide in. And they'll be looking and looking and looking and can't see him and then they, he's right at their feet, right laying along the fence there. It'll just coloration and he'll just be completely quiet and people right. won't even see him. Yeah, that's one of the adventures of going to a zoo is you wonder, am I going to see one of these animals? And then is, is that an empty display? And then you then you have the, the aha when you finally spot him. Absolutely, and that's one of the things I like is, you know, if people have to stop, think and look, mm -hmm. I think that's good. I think that's, you know, you're kind of adjusting them to the wild. They should be able to 
you know, quit with the phone and all the other stuff right, and, right. and be able to focus on something new in their life. And the idea that they could focus on trying to find the animals or whatever, kind of a where's Waldo at Wildlife Imaging. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I, I want to come visit your, your site. I mean, is there admission? Is it free? Do I need to make an appointment? Uh, you don't need to make an appointment. You can just come out as you, as you feel fit. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, self-guided tours. We used to have only... Um, guided tours mm -hmm. so that you'd come out and there'd be a tour guide that would take you around and now that's uh, self-guided so you come out you get a map and all the information and you can just wander around on your own take all the pictures take as much time as you want um, if you would like a guided tour that's an option as well okay so, and then if you become a member that's another way that we ra raise money is become a member of wildlife images that helps us sustain our operation as well so we encourage people to become members at any given level and all that's on our website at wildlifeimages.org Okay, and we'll certainly be putting your information up so people can reach out to you if they have any questions I haven't thought about. Yeah. One other question I did have, do you take food donations? We do indeed. Um, we uh, can take certain food, we can't take freezer burn meat, things like that. Mm -hmm. But if you just give us a call ahead of time, we can tell you exactly what we can take and cannot take. Right. Well, Dave, I'm, I'm just so happy that you were able to come in today and, and have us meet Rosie, who were, I she, think she's, she's under the pillows. In the cushions. <laughs> she's but, like, okay. Yeah, I just want to, I want to thank you for coming in and for, for dedicating your life to God's creatures and, and providing, providing those resources to our community where our kids can come in, where we can come in and learn about animals and learn how to behave around them. So thank you for that. My pleasure. It's, I think it's critical that we create room in our hearts for the animals and the wildlife and pay attention to it. You know, the only population of animals that seems to increase always is humans. That's right. And uh, so we need to do a better job of taking care of the wild spaces as well. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us on this episode. We're gonna put up Dave's contact information. Reach out to him if you have any questions, if you'd like to volunteer, if you'd like to come and meet the animals there at Wildlife Images. Until then, uh, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of Better Life Today. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.